Hello, BookTube. David Wiley and I are doing a read-along of The Two Towers, the middle part of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Uh, there are a few other BookTubers who are joining in informally. Tony at An Erudite Adventure just did a video today full of thoughts about the opening chapters that we're reading. It's an interesting way to go at this. I haven't done it quite this way ever in all the time that I've been reading Tolkien to start at not just picking and choosing chapters, but reading straight through at the death of Boromir instead of at the beginning of the Fellowship. And I've been loving the experience so much that I've been doing lots and lots of videos <laughs> instead of just one summary video once in a while. Uh, and I've been going chapter by chapter, and we are today up to uh, the chapter called The Road to Isengard. And it shows uh, a return to a pattern that we have seen many times before. In the Two Towers, the, the story, the general story, is one that you already know, which is that an object, a MacGuffin of tremendous magical power, has been found, the, the One Ring. And a fellowship of heroes decides to walk it south, and most of them are kind of hoping that they will bring it into the stronghold of the Dark Lord Sauron and destroy it there, the only place that it can be destroyed. They don't want to safeguard it, they especially don't want to use it. They want to destroy it so that it's no longer an issue. It contains a great deal of Sauron's energy. If it's destroyed, he's much weakened. And they have bad luck right away. In the Fellowship, they have bad, bad luck right away. Uh, Gandalf, the wizard who is leading them, falls into a uh, chasm fighting a monster and seems to die. Uh, the Fellowship has to flee from uh, roving bands of orcs. And... Boromir, one of the main characters in the Fellowship of the Ring, a man from the king, the southern kingdom of Gondor, where our heroes are technically sort of headed, tries to take the One Ring from its bearer, the hobbit Frodo. Because he, at least he's telling himself, I, what I want to do is save my people. I want to save my kingdom. We're at war with Mordor. Not a magical war. Not exclusively a magical war, but mainly a physical war of horses and armor and catapults and whatnot. Of course, the more you read in the book, and you're also told explicitly, the more you know that that might be what Boromir is saying, but the ring has ideas of its own, and it is thoroughly evil. It corrupts the people who use it. You think that you will use it for good, uh, but you won't. It will use you. That is why Elrond, the, ma the elven lore master, that is why Galadriel, the one of the most powerful elves in Middle-earth, that's why Gandalf himself absolutely refused to use it. Uh, and Gandalf gets angry when he's tempted, uh, because he knows, he says, I would use this for good. And my, that would be my thought. But through me, it would work evil. Uh, all of that happens, and then this fellowship is broken apart. Frodo and his servant Sam decide that rather than risk any more of these th this kind of temptation, they will walk the ring into Mordor alone. They head off on their own, alone. And a gigantic band of orcs... Uh, attacks the party and abducts two other hobbits, Merry and Pippin. And in the process, they slay Boromir, who lives just long enough to, to confess to Aragorn, the heir to that southern kingdom and our, our main hero, that he tried to take the ring. That he, he tried to take the ring from Frodo, and he has paid. Uh, and then he dies. <laughs> uh, and all of those negative things happen so that Whatever was the original plan when this group set out from Elrond's house is now in tatters. Now uh, Aragorn and the dwarf Gimli and the elf Legolas decide to chase after the band of orcs that captured Merry and Pippin because it's their only moral imperative left. If they chase after Frodo and Sam, they know that they're leaving Merry and Pippin to torment, to being tortured to death, and maybe horribly mutated in the stronghold of uh, Isengard. The, the Tower of Orthanc, which is the, the stronghold of another power in Middle-earth, a wizard, another wizard, Saruman, who we learn in the course of the books that we're reading so far, uh, has himself been corrupted, is himself evil. The wizard was sent to Middle-earth in order to combat Sauron and to buck up the spirits of men and keep them vigilant and keep them valiant. And somewhere along the way, Saruman was perverted by that. Now, in addition to building an army on his own, he is building his own kind of orc, 
that is taller and stronger than normal orcs, than the, the orcs that, that Sauron is using. And in addition to maybe dabbling and making great rings of his own, he also wants the One Ring uh, for his own. We're told a couple of times that the One Ring is more dangerous the more power the person who wields it already has. So you put it on a hobbit, you're going to get a power drunk hobbit. <laughs> That's about it. You put it on Saruman, you're going to get a second Dark Lord. Saruman and and Sauron are the same kind of supernatural being. Uh, so Sar Saruman has both of those things. He has turned. So in addition to seeking the One Ring, he's also making war on his neighbor. Just as Sauron is making war on Gondor, Saruman is making war on Rohan, which is a kingdom that we've spent a lot of time in in this book. It's a kingdom of simple, brave, hardy horsemen, <laughs> the type that has been imitated endlessly in epic fantasy since Tolkien originated them. Uh, and uh, Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli chase off after that band of orcs, knowing that it's hopeless. And it's right around then, despite all of these setbacks, that we start to see in the course of the Two Towers that, believe it or not, luck is kind of breaking in our hero's favor. Repeatedly. Escalatingly. If you think about it, escalatingly, one enormous piece of luck, <laughs> which we got to in an earlier chapter, is that it turns out Gandalf isn't really dead. He he got uh, severely beaten up, severely damaged, maybe even killed by that Balrog, and then he got better. <laughs> so he is not really dead. He is back, and he's had, he's had a power upgrade. He's Gandalf the White, far more effective against the, the, the threat of Sauron than Gandalf the Grey was. That's one stroke of luck. Another stroke of luck is that uh, when Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are running after that band of orcs, they encounter a band of the warriors of Rohan. And that band happens to be led by a man named Aramor, who is honorable. And who doesn't try to fight these three or capture them, or doesn't try to decapitate them or anything like that, doesn't view them as enemies, even though his king, Theoden, has, left, has issued explicit orders that they are to be viewed as enemies. It just so happens that they come across an upright, just ruler of his horse band. So they are not only allowed to go on their way, but given horses to go on their way. That's another stroke of luck. A third stroke of luck is that Merry and Pippin are not dead. <laughs> they they encounter ants. They encounter Treebeard and ants. Huge, 14-foot-tall, tree-ish type beings that are not orf, they are not orcs, they are not elves, they are not dwarfs, they are not men. They are a different race of beings in Middle-earth that we haven't seen before. They just happen to encounter him, and that, that also is a very good stroke of luck. Also, when all of our, when our main heroes, Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, and also Gandalf, are reunited and make their way to the hall of King Theoden, well, they find that he's, his will has been sapped by his evil counselor, Grima Wormtongue, who is working for Saruman. So Saruman is making war on Rohan, but he's also got a spy in the house of the king who is sapping his will, constantly telling him to worry that you're too old for this, don't trust these these counselors, don't trust Amor, for instance. Uh, and it just so happens that uh, Gandalf, through his wizardry, uh, is able to fix that. He could not have been able to fix that. It could, it could be that, it, what if Theoden had been too far gone? We meet a character later on who is too far gone. Another ruler who is too far gone. He cannot be fixed. It just so happens that he can be. And that it happens fairly quickly, in fact, in the course of a conversation. Theoden goes from being bent over and helpless and spidery and also hateful, he hates his guests, especially Gandalf, to being an echo of his former self, a warrior lord, a horse lord. Uh, all of that is good luck. That, those are all good turns for our heroes. None of those things had to happen that way. And once Theoden is brought to his senses, uh... Gandalf convinces him that immediate action is needed. He needs to march out right away for the Fords of Isen, where his men are fighting against the forces of Saruman, where they're fighting a totally territorial. We're not talking about sorcery here. They're for, we're fighting against a territorial battle against the forces of Orthanc. And the king and his men surely are needed. Surely the king decides to go to war himself. Surely that itself would be worth a great boon to his hard-pressed men. And they're on that route. They're, they're taking that route when suddenly Gandalf changes the plan. You're not to go there. Instead, you're to go to Helm's Deep, 
and I'm not going with you. <laughs> I'm taking off. I got some place to be. And he takes off. And our heroes go to Helm's Deep. Now, this is the pattern that we saw so far in the two towers that I've mentioned, sort of poking fun at it a little. I know that Tolkien knows what he's doing, so I'm not poking fun at it for real. But the pattern repeats over and over again that in a chapter, heroes in Group A meet somebody, whether it's Gandalf or Treebeard or Orcs or the writers in Rohan, they meet somebody, they talk, and then they decide, off we go. <laughs> that happens over and over and over again. And I mentioned last time, if you're going to keep doing that, sooner or later you're going to need a payoff. And we get a payoff, because Theoden and his men, a thousand people, maybe a little more, uh, are besieged at Helm's Deep. They are, they are attacked at Helm's Deep by three to four times that many orcs. All of Saruman's army attacks them at Helm's Deep. Saruman has, as we're told, emptied Orthanc. Uh, and that chapter, the last chapter that we dealt with, the chapter called Helm's Deep, is an epic piece of fighting. Our heroes are hard-pressed to it. It looks at one point like Aragorn, Aragorn is lost. He is saved by Gimli. It looks at another point later on in the chapter that Gimli is lost. Uh, and then the chapter, the chapter ends with another stroke of great luck. Something very strange. <laughs> Gandalf returns, and he's not alone. He has not only Erkenbrand, uh, the lord of the Westfold, the area that the, that the orcs are desecrating, but also a mysterious forest <laughs> that wasn't there before. Now, readers know what our main, what most of our main characters don't know, because we've read the chapters where Merry and Pippin meet Treebeard, the Ent. They convince Treebeard, really their arrival does more than anything that they say, they convince Treebeard that, as he puts it, something big is happening in the outside world. And he convinces the Ents to go to war with Isengard. They are mad at Saruman for letting orcs rampage in the forest, cutting down trees, burning things, making industry out of what was once a wooded area. Uh, as Treebeard says later on, a wizard should know better. And a wizard has to be dealt with. He's a neighbor. I can't just leave him alone on the border of my lands. So Treebeard and the Ents and Merry and Pippin march off to Isengard. Now, keep in mind, they don't know that Saruman has emptied his kingdom to fight Rohan. They have no idea. They think they're headed... Uh, Orthanc is a, is a massively fortified ring with a tower in the middle. Isengard is an almost impenetrable fortress. And the Ents think that 10,000 armed orcs and men are in that fortress. That's why Treebeard says we probably are marching to our doom, but we're doing it anyway because we're all worked up and this is this is unanswerable. We have to do something. They don't know. This is another piece of good luck. They arrive at Isengard at exactly the moment that Saruman is sending his troops out against Rohan, against Helm's Deep. They arrive at exactly that moment and they freeze solid like, <laughs> geez, it's the cops. They, they just take that position like that and the forces of, of Saruman don't notice. They march by. We're told very tellingly that there are so many forces that it takes a whole hour for them to march past the Ents. That's a lot of people. That's a lot more than King Theoden has. Uh, that's pure luck, and it works in our hero's favor. That leaves Orthanc virtually undefended when the Ents attack it. Uh, so we, we shift back to the end of the chapter of Helm's Deep, and we see that uh, the Ents have herded a lot of their semi-sentient Huorns, their, their sort of semi-sentient tree cattle, to Helm's Deep. These trees, and especially the Ents who heard them, really, really hate orcs. <laughs> they really hate them. Them and their haroom baroom chopping with their axes. So they've got a they've got a score to settle when they get to Helm's Deep. And uh, the chapter ends that way. Theoden thought that he was riding out of his... He wasn't going to be taken like an old badger in his hole. He decides to ride out, and he is assuming that he will die. In that he's riding into a sea of enemies. He, he assumes that he will die. But Gandalf and Erkenbrand and that strange forest all show up, totally unlooked for. So, the end of Helm's Deep is yet another uh, group of lucky strokes. The, the, this is, things are going well for our heroes. And that brings us to our chapter today, which is called The Road to Isengard. And which is going to give some readers flashbacks because it Tolkien, he was building up with all of those away we goes. He was building up 
to a climax. And he gives us that in the great battle scene of Helm's Deep. Uh, but he doesn't have two of those scenes in him, not back to back. <laughs> so, so we get back to the pattern of characters meeting. Group A meets group B, and then they talk, and then they say, off we go. <laughs> we get back to that. It's wonderfully done, so you don't mind. Uh, one of the first happy moments, another happy accident that we get at the, at the beginning of the chapter, is that Gimli is not dead. He was cut off from his friends and had to take shelter in the glittering caves underneath Helm's Deep, which are far older than the Rohirrim and have been exquisitely carved. There's a, there's a passage. I love to quote it. It's not, it's not like Gimli at all, as Legolas points out. It's really not like him at all, but Gimli can't help but sing the praises. This is by far the most dialogue that we get from him. He can't help but sing the praises of those caves. I want to read just a bit of that. Uh, there are columns of white and saffron and dawn rose, Legolas, fluted and twisted into dreamlike forms. They spring up from many-colored floors to meet the glistening pendants of the roof. Wings, ropes, curtains fine as frozen clouds, spears, banners, pinnacles of suspended palaces. Still lakes mirror them. A glimmering world looks up from dark pools, covered with clear glass. Cities such as the mind of Durin could scarce have imagined in his sleep stretch out through avenues and pillared courts on into the dark recesses where no light can come. And plink, silver drop falls, and the round wrinkles in the glass make all the towers bend and waver like weeds and corals in a grotto of the sea. Then evening comes. They fade and twinkle out. The torches pass on into another chamber and another dream. There is a chamber after chamber, Legolas, Hall opening out of hall, dome after dome, stair upon stair, and still the winding paths lead on into the mountain's heart. Caves, the caverns of Helm's Deep, happy are the what was the chance that drove me there. It makes me weep to leave them. <laughs> that is incredible. He tells Legolas that uh, Legolas sort of kids with him and says, I suppose you want all of your dwarf friends to go in there and start hacking away at this place. And Gimli says, you're talking like a fool. You haven't seen them, so you don't know what you're talking about. If my kin came here, once in a generation, we would make one perfect chisel, and that's it. This is perf We would only enhance the perfection. It would be reverent. It's actually wonderful. Uh, uh, and Legolas is moved. <laughs> he is moved by that. And he's moved himself by something else. Legolas, at this point in the story, is still has his heart in the forest. That isn't going to stay true. He's been warned. Once you experience the sea... You might feel different. But right now, his heart is in the forest. And as our heroes are leaving the scene, King Theoden and Gandalf have met again. And uh, Gandalf has said something very strange. He has said, well, I'm going to Isengard. Do Maybe you want to come with me. <laughs> Theoden says to him, even if all the warriors that I could possibly lay my hands on anywhere in my kingdom were all here and healthy and healed from their wounds, we wouldn't have a, a fraction of the strength we need to attack Isengard. Gandalf says, nevertheless, that's where I'm going. You can come with me or not. And so they are leaving. Of course, you, you, you're going to take Gandalf's word at this point. And when while they're leaving, Legolas looks back and sees eyes. Eyes looking out from the trees. Those horns, those, the, the, the herds that the Ents have drawn. King Theoden sees Ents in the, in the living light of day. He sees them. These things out of legend. And they have very little concern for him. They really aren't interested in him. It's a really good, sort of prototypical description of an alien race. These Ents, and especially the trees they're herding, really don't have much interest in what King Theoden is doing. They don't even pay much attention. Not a lot of them are like Treebeard. Uh, and Gandalf tells them that. He says, you know, they're not really concerned with you at all. Don't worry about it. Uh, but they, they move on. And... Uh, Theoden is, is amazed at all of this. I mean, he wasn't expecting to be alive. He's a bit of a Debbie Downer. He keeps saying that he's not going to live much longer, and we, of course, know that he's not. But uh, he's talking mainly about age, and he's astounded by what he has seen. Just astounded that he has seen Ents, like something out of a, a children's story, come alive. I want to stress that that is a kind of recurring theme in this book. People often talk about The Lord of the Rings as in the way of saying that the hobbits experience a constant broadening of their world. None of them have ever left the Shire before. 
and they might have you know sam might have glimpsed elves in the woods some of them have glimpsed elves in the woods maybe they've heard stories about dwarves that come through brie but they don't know anything about the broader world and the beginning of the fellowship is the broadening of their worldview as they encounter one thing after another that they didn't imagine but i want to stress that happens to everybody except gandalf that happens to everybody uh even gandalf is surprised by the ants going to war but it happens to all the characters it starts in the fellowship but it moves on from there. Theoden is an old king. He has been in Middle-earth a long time. He's seen a lot. Never occurred to him in a million years that Ents were real, much less that he would meet them. Uh, but he, he has a melancholy thought about that, and it's a note that Tolkien hits throughout the book. He says uh, that he's amazed. Gandalf tells him, you had allies more than you thought, whether you knew about it or not. And Theoden says, yet I also should be sad. For however the fortune of war shall go, may it not so end that much that was fair and wonderful shall pass forever out of Middle-earth. We've already had that note struck by Galadriel, among other people. Uh, we know for certain that Elrond thinks that when the One Ring, if the One Ring is destroyed, the power of the Elven Rings will fade as well, that all that was beautiful that they knew will disappear. Uh, that note is struck often, and Gandalf says all, the only thing he can, he says it may be, the evil of Sauron cannot be wholly cured, nor made as if it had not been. Uh, but to such days we are doomed. Let us now go on with the journey we have begun. That's what he tells uh, Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli earlier. He says, well, they say, what will we do now? And Ar Gandalf tells them, if we fail, we f if we fall, if we fail, we fall. If we succeed, we go on to the next task. That's all that you can do. That's all that you can do. We can't guarantee that the... the this will make the world better. It's a very, very kind of real-world attitude that, Tol that uh, Tolkien takes to all of this that I really like. I really enjoy that. Uh, and uh, that, that ends the chapter except for one more stroke of good luck. Because Theoden doesn't know what's in, Gan in Gandalf's mind. Gandalf does not explain himself. But why on earth are we marching to Isengard? That is surely suicide. Gandalf knows what Theoden does not, which is that not only did Saruman empty his kingdom to throw his forces against Rohan, but that ready and waiting at his gate when his kingdom was empty were ants, the last thing anyone expected. Uh, Gandalf knows this. He has been using the speed of Shadowfax to zip from one place to another. So he comes no bearing this knowledge, but he doesn't tell anybody. Uh, and when they get to Isengard, they encounter a ruin. Isengard is the Tower of Orthanc. But then surrounding it is a gigantic circle uh, with tall walls, thick walls, gigantic menacing chain-bound gates, and they are ripped apart. They aren't just open. They're destroyed. We're told that the raging sea, if it had bombarded Isengard, could not have done any more damage. We see the result of what the Ents have done. <laughs> we see that they have physically destroyed Saruman's stronghold. Except for the Tower of Orthanc itself, which was made by the men of Westerness by, by Numenor, and is proof against physical force. But everything else around there that Saruman was using to make into uh, uh, the horror works of a territorial war machine has all been destroyed and half drowned by open springs and broken dams. We encounter that, and in the midst of all of that chaos, idling away on the top of a ruined wall, we encounter Merry and Pippin. <laughs> Gimli and Legolas and, and Aragorn encounter these two hobbits. The two hobbits that they have chased over hell and gone to find. They encounter them just idly enjoying themselves. Because <laughs> they, they are the, now, the new door wardens of, of Isengard. Uh, it is under, as they tell our friends in the next chapter, Isengard is under new management. <laughs> the Ents are in control of Isengard. And that's how the chapter ends. So on one level, it is the return of our old friend, the pattern, where we, we meet somebody, we talk, and then off we go. <laughs> we, we march to Isengard. Uh, it's kind of a, it's meant to be a, a subdominant chapter. It's very much meant to be a pendant to the action of Helm's Deep. Uh, and we're just going to move on. We're going to move on next time uh, to the next chapter, which is, which is fascinating. I don't know if I'll talk about it tomorrow, uh, but... The next time I do, that's what I'll do. I'm just going to go chapter by chapter in this thing. I love it too much not to. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.